Hello and welcome to Things We Said Today, our bi-weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, collectively and individually, past, present, things to come, whatever it is, we got it, we think. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles From the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything, and the forthcoming McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, 1969-73, to Beyond the Beatles, should be out next year. I'm joined by my regular co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, and the podcast, Talk More Talk. Uh, hello, Ken. How are you doing? I'm good, Alan. Hello to all of our listeners. Okay. And Darren DeVivo, DJ at WFUV 90.7 in the New York area since 1983. Uh, and if you're not in the vicinity of New York, you can hear him and everything else on WFUV at WFUV.org. How are you doing, Darren? All is well. How are you doing, Alan? Hi, Ken. And Hi to all our listeners. Okay. And today we're going to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the release of All Things Must Pass, George's first or second solo album, depending how you count these things, or maybe even third. His first solo album of conventional pop-like songs, anyway. And uh, before we get to that, though, we will have our usual news segment presided over by the one and only Ken. The one and only. The one and Thank only. you, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> and thank For, goodness there's only one. <laughs> yeah, I, I second that emotion. <laughs> Let's start off with a few news items on the upcoming McCartney 3 album, which has been delayed another week due to unforeseeable production delays. Its release date is now December 18th. I've heard that it has something to do with the uh, all the different colored vinyl, that that's going to take a little bit longer. That's at least the reason that we've been given. But it'll only be one more week. December 18th is the release date for that. Um, there was some speculation that on November 13th we would get the new single from Paul. Instead, Paul issued a six-song EP through Spotify of songs of his with the theme of home, including... Eat at Home, Cook of the House, Mull of Kintyre, Home Tonight, Every Night, and Heart of the Country. And last Friday, November 20th, we got a second six-song EP with a holiday playlist, including Wonderful Christmas Time, Coming Up, Pipes of Peace, The Christmas Song, Hosanna, and Lady Madonna Live from Wings, from Wings Over America. McCartney 3, in addition to all the colored vinyl versions and standard vinyl and CD versions, will also be available on cassette. But to drive the collector even more crazy, following all the limited edition vinyl versions, there are now CD bundles you can buy. The CDs are for four different colors, and each color will come with a bonus demo track. There's one different track for each color, and there are a variety of bundles you can get for each color, coming with a mask for COVID-19, a T-shirt, the pouch with the McCartney dice in it, and a McCartney cap to wear. I know that the two of you collect a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Any comments you'd like to make about the latest bunch of collectors' merchandise? Um, the CDs, you should say, are also uh, available separately, uh, and they're available separately in two forms. One is in a sort of, you know, just sort of cardboard sleeve, and those are charging like seven ninety nine for those. And they're also in a, uh, they called it a soft pack. I'm not sure what that's supposed to mean, but obviously more than just the little slip the disc in the cardboard thing. Uh, and those were, you know, closer to normal CD range. So I've bought all four and the CD, the norm, regular CD, uh, and the seven, one or two of the, I think I have the black vinyl and the red vinyl. But I mean, I have to draw a line at some point because there's undoubtedly going to be some huge, uh, you know, suitcase like thing uh which i'll probably also get so uh you know i want to 
want to devote the remaining cash to that. Alan, your wife knows all this? Um, well, yeah. Okay. You know, and not only that, not only does she know all this, but I wouldn't be surprised if she went online and ordered me something that I hadn't ordered myself, and it turns up because she's done that in the past. Ah. Oh. You know, they don't make wives like this. <laughs> uh, because uh, if my wife gets wind of all the things that I've bought, yeah. she'll be looking for a new co-host. <laughs> Actually, I'm just joking. Yeah. No, I'm not, but I am in a way. <laughs> um, yeah, I went, uh, I got the, um, I ordered each of the colored CDs. I think I got, I'm trying to remember now, because part of this is also very confused. Even if you have, we're sitting on, billions of dollars and can get every single thing it was a little confusing sorting through these bundles yeah uh that they made available i'm assuming there's going to be as of now a grand total of four bonus tracks each colored cd will have one bonus track that is consistent with all that same color in other words all red cds are going to have one song extra right uh white what was the other's Blue. What were the other four, two colors of the? Uh, it was white, yellow, red, and blue. And blue. Yeah. Yeah. So I ordered the uh, soft pack CDs, and um, I got the the boxes too. But I didn't go crazy with any of the giveaway items. I just went. I just got dice because I figured that they'll be like little thing for the shelf. You know, little chachka mm -hmm. to put on the shelves and i i don't really need the hats the t-shirts the masks because after all a couple of weeks after the album comes out there will be probably be a whole line of houseware items and uh you know bed sheets of mccartney three and stuff that will be available don't give many ideas <laughs> <laughs> and um yeah so that's for those and of course all the colored vinyl i got a number of them but not all of them on the way mm. Well, you know, with me, I'm just getting the regular CD. I'm kind of boring that way. Ken's but, the regular uh, kind of guy. <laughs> Alan and I are more colorful. Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> but I will wait until the deluxe edition comes out, and I'll buy that so I'll have all the tracks that I need. And in the meantime, since we cover all the extra material, I know that there are lots of really nice people in my life, co-hosts of mine, for example, that are nice enough to just email me MP3s because that these are all nice people, people who listen to the show, people who I work with. So I have a feeling I'll keep up to date. Hmm. Who are these people? I don't know. Any <laughs> people. One can get into trouble um, emailing MP3s. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's get on with more news. Paul appears in the latest two issues of two major magazines. In Rolling Stone, he's on the front cover with Taylor Swift, and there is a five-page conversation between the two stars, making a parallel between Paul's new album and Taylor's last album, Folklore, and that both were recorded during this lockdown period. And uh, also, the new issue of Uncut Magazine has Paul on the front cover with the words, Goes Far Out and dare to experiment around him. They review the new McCartney 3 album and give it 9 out of 10 stars. Mm -hmm. November 10th saw the premiere on YouTube of Paul's animated short for Rupert and the Frog Song, newly remastered in 4K, and I would say looking absolutely stunning. The picture is now so sharp, and also the music has been reissued digitally, also remastered, sounding superb. So you can buy them as digital files. So if you've seen it, you know, it looks the best you've ever seen. And it makes me wonder, because there was that DVD that came out, the Paul McCartney Animation Collection, mm -hmm. where he had two other animated shorts. I hope that he does the same thing for those. Mm -hmm. Maybe there'll be a reissue of that. Mm. I forgot all about that DVD. It's really enjoyable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I love the two other shorts. And the music that he has for those, too. Speaking of remastering videos, on November 20th, YouTube premiered the new remaster for the video for Paul's Coming Up. Again, such a very sharp and clear picture. An excellent job was done for that. And kind of like what I just said about the animation collection, makes me wonder if further on down the road, because we keep on seeing these remastered videos now. Mm -hmm. Will there be a McCartney Years? with remastered videos 
That would be sweet. Did that come out on Blu-ray yet? I can't remember whether that was Blu-ray or just DVD. I think it was strictly DVD, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Do you know, Darren? I know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was just DVD, yeah. Yeah. And, oh, before we go to the next news item, Darren, you wanted to say something more about McCartney 3? Uh, there is a new colored vinyl. Uh, yet another one that was announced just today. What color is it? It's a, like a burnt orange, a dark orange that is available from Universal through You Discover Music. I think that's You, Dis you Discover or You Discover Music through Universal. So that's one more colored vinyl uh, uh, edition of McCartney 3 out there for you to uh, add to the other 57 that you've already purchased. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah. Uh, no word on how many copies were made for this? No, I didn't see anything. Just uh, you, just uh, like a link to go to youdiscovermusic.com. Okay. Uh, so it's like the uh, online store, I guess, for Universal. They now have a dark or burnt orange colored vinyl uh, edition of McCartney 2. So okay. uh, not McCartney 2, sorry, McCartney 3 that's available. And that was as of today, the day we're recording this show, the Monday before Thanksgiving. Right. And that's you discover. That's the letter U. Discover. Letter U. Discover music dot com. Right. Okay. In other news, since we are doing a show on all things must pass, there was a radio documentary for its fiftieth anniversary that just aired on BBC Radio Four uh, this past weekend, November twenty first. Composer Nitin Sani told the story of the making of George's most successful album, and the special included interviews with Olivia Harrison, Michael Palin, Jules Holland, biographers Graham Thompson and Joshua M. Green, keyboard player Bobby Whitlock, drummer Alan White, and guitarist Dave Mason. Now, I happen to know that on their website, it's going to be available, they're saying, for a year. Hmm. If you want to listen to this radio special, I've made it very easy for you to find it because I posted an article on this right on our own Facebook page at Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans. Okay, good work. Okay. Also, the Daily Mail has reported that Yoko Ono is stepping back from her work and handing her business interests over to Sean as she has decided to slow down as she is now at the age of 87. Sean has been appointed as director of eight companies linked to the family and the Beatles, including Apple Corps. Sean has joined the board at Len Solo, which manages the music rights for some of John's solo output. Um, a spokesman for Yoko says Yoko continues to oversee John's estate, but has drafted in Sean as a director to assist where necessary. The article also says that for several years, Yoko has been suffering from an illness without disclosing what that is. Mm -hmm. I think we could all see this coming, yeah. especially with the news that Sean was doing all that work and helping to compile the, the uh, track listing for Give Me Some Truth. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's not surprising. I mean, she's been in a wheelchair for a little bit, a little while and, uh, you know, said to, well, I mean, she's 87, you know. Mm hmm. Yep. Um, so here's hoping yeah, Sean I, is a, I, here's hoping Sean is a good custodian of it all. I'm sure he will be. Mm -hmm. I you know you know that his heart will be in the right place and protecting and and preserving the legacy and putting out good releases, real strong releases, is probably what's uh, uppermost in his concern when it comes to you know John's catalog. Right. So uh, yeah. Also, there is a brand new. New coffee table book out right now. It just came out on the Plastic on All Band. I just got it today. I haven't had a chance to look through it, but we'll be talking about it on the next show, which will be another Lennon tribute show. Uh, we'll talk about that later on. Um, and there's also another new book on John called The Complete John Lennon Songs by Paul DeNoyer. And it goes through all of John's solo songs with uh, information about each one. We'll probably talk about that in our next show. The new December issue of Record Collector is out with John Lennon on the front cover. It looks like a photo from him circa Mind Games time with the heading underneath the reassessment of an icon. Also author Jerry Hammack has just finished the fifth 
and final volume of his series of books on the Beatles called The Beatles Recording Reference Manual, Let It Be, through Abbey Road, 1969 and 1970, and it's now available on Amazon. Really great books he's put out, especially if you want to know the whole recording process of each Beatles song, who plays what, what was the instrumentation or the models used on each instrument and how it was mixed. Great work overall from Jerry. Mm -hmm. So uh, the new one is now out. Mm -hmm. Also, Peter Asher's recent book, The Beatles from A to Z, A Magical History Tour, has just been reprinted in paperback. Peter was a great guest for us here on this show a while back. So I'd advise you, if you're interested in purchasing either the hardcover or the paperback, go back to our show with Peter, because that's what the whole interview is about. Uh, also, the group Theater Within from New York City, who are known for putting on John Lennon tributes every year since his death, around the time of his uh, passing, uh, recently did one for John's 80th birthday, and they'll be having an encore tribute concert for Thanksgiving weekend. It's a virtual concert that will be streaming for free from November 25th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time to Sunday, November 29th at midnight. It'll include performances of Lennon music from some of their regular performers who have been involved with this through the years, plus some new ones. Artists include Jackson Brown, Patti Smith, Natalie Merchant, Taj Mahal, Roseanne Cash, Yorma McCalkinen, Kev Moe, Joan Osborne, Martin Sexton, Mark Cohn, Shelby Lynn, Rich Pagano of the Fab Faux, and others. These are all artists that you'd hear on a regular basis if you listen to WFUV. The, the tributes... <laughs> The tribute is a benefit for Theater Within in support of their ongoing free workshops for those impacted with cancer. And they also sell merchandise like CDs, Blu-rays, and books, and special autographed items from Roseanne Cash and Natalie Merchant. If you need more information, you just go to this website where you can stream the uh, tribute concert. Lennon Tribute 40, that's the number 40, dot org couple more uh, news items. Violinist Patrick Roberts has just released a new album called Imagine the Tribute with 11 songs, nine of which are his covers of Beatles songs, plus a cover of Imagine. And he covers Saltwater, Julian Lennon's song, hmm. which actually has Julian on it with guitarist Tommy Emmanuel. Wow. You can actually watch a video for this as well brand new version of Saltwater with Julian doing the lead vocals. Thanks to John Bazzini for this information. And our last news item concerns Brian Ray from Paul McCartney's band. He has a new song out, which is called Got a New Thing. It's on Wicked Cool Records and was voted as the coolest song of the week by Little Steven for his Underground Garage channel. Look for a new video coming, which will have Abe Laboreal Jr. in it. And uh, another friend of Brian, Scott Schreiner. You can pre-order a signed single from Brian at brianray.com. That's all the news I have this time. Okay. Very nice. Um, maybe as an addendum, short addendum, uh, I, the Peter Asher book, um, I noticed that you could order it from the Fest for Beatle fans and get it autographed and personalized. I'm not sure if there was a deadline to be able to do that, but... Uh, that was in their most recent mailing. Um, just thought I would mention that for anyone who might want an autograph copy. Okay. Well, it's probably on the website. Mm -hmm. They probably let you know if it's autographed. So yeah. do check that out, thefest.com. All right. Okay. So on to all things must pass. Let's see. I know Darren must have been not born yet when it came out. Is that true? <laughs> No, no, I was I was five. You were five. I was five years old. So you had. Yeah, I remember walking to the store to buy my. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, no, I was five. I was five years old. Did did it uh, in, impinge on your consciousness at that time? No, the album didn't. It's very possible. My sweet lord was the very first solo single I owned because I remember having it. And again, it's the strange things that you remember from from your youth. When I mean, when you're very young. I remember, you know, finding it intriguing that the apple was not cut in half on isn't on side B on on the uh, isn't it a pity side, mm -hmm. and that kind of stuck with me is kind of my my memory that yes, indeed, you had the single, 
Darren, when you uh, were still five years old. So um, I didn't get the album myself until later on, probably towards the probably around 76 or so. Uh, and again, I go by the copy I have. Apple was done. So it was an orange capital pressing mm-hmm. for me. So, uh, you know, was it so I didn't have nothing from the beginning. Was it still a triple album when you got it? Oh, yeah. Okay. Always a triple. Yeah, it was triple. It was, it was actually packaged exactly the same, you know, except for it was on Capitol uh, as opposed to Apple. Came with the poster, mm. all the, uh, you know, in the black box with all of the, um, you know, with the colored inner sleeves, the purple. I think one was like a gold colored inner sleeve, something like that, olive green, mm-hmm. I think. So uh, I was much more fortunate many years later to get a copy of uh, the concert for Bangladesh at a used record store, still sealed, dirt cheap. When I opened it up, I was thrilled that it was an original Apple, and but I wasn't that fortunate with all things must pass. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, hmm. Ken, do you remember your early encounters with it? I remember being overwhelmed by it, mainly because you know it's it's a double album. Uh, depending on how you look at it, whether you consider it double or triple, mm-hmm. there's a lot of material. A lot of the the music, certainly lyrically, was way over my head, not understanding spirituality at all. Mm -hmm. I would have been uh, 11 years old then. And uh, certain songs were easily accessible to me, like My Sweet Lord and What Is Life and Awaiting on You All, Apple Scruffs, you know. But to get to the heavier stuff, whether we're talking about musically, instrumentation-wise, or lyrically, you know, that took a few years before I started to really get into the, the philosophical and spiritual stuff that George is writing about. <laughs> but um, but I love the whole packaging of All Things Must Pass, opening it up and having lyrics for each album and having different colored sleeves for each of the albums. Mm-hmm. That was pretty cool. And I used to look at, you know, the different apples on the label from the different Beatles and, and Beatle records, too. That was a really uh, cool part of, you know, that record label right there. That what they would do, having the freedom to have different colored apples and, you know, right. that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, but uh, I certainly liked a lot of it, but couldn't fully comprehend and appreciate it when it first came out. Okay. What about uh, My Sweet Lord and, and uh, Isn't It a Pity, the, the single? Did, did those knock you out when you first heard them, or did those take a while? Oh, My Sweet Lord knocked me out immediately. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, even to this day, there's no other record like it. <laughs> For a song that was a hit record that mixed rock with spirituality and was a chant like that, mm-hmm. yeah, I loved everything about it. It was so damn catchy. I loved the slide guitar part. Isn't It a Pity I love too. Mm-hmm. It was always difficult when you're younger to accept really long tracks, <laughs> although I had no problem with Hey Jude. Right. But, uh, you know, Isn't It a Pity went on very long. The only problem I ever had really overall was going into the future with, um, with, this, with this album was I, I never saw the need for our two versions of Isn't It a Pity. But I loved the first version the most. Mm-hmm. I think it was so masterfully produced. And the orchestration that was uh, part of it, John Barham, you should get give him all the credit for that. Yeah, I loved it. It was very easy for me to like, isn't it a pity? Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's easy to turn away from really long tracks like that when you're a young kid. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Yeah, I, I liked hearing a different version of it, you know, just because, uh, you know, in a way, the same way we like bootlegs, you know, when we hear a, a, a track that's different from the one we know. So getting to the one on the second disc, uh, you know, and, and hearing it, it's the same song, but it's a completely different arrangement and uh, really only like less than five minutes. Right. Um, it, you know, that, that I thought was interesting because it's, you know, I just like hearing when musicians have different ideas about how a song can go. And usually the public just gets one of them, you know, uh, mm-hmm. and, but, but this showed that, you know, George is thinking, you know, there are different ways this song can go. What does he have in mind? You know, sort of took the first one as the preferred one. I mean, otherwise it wouldn't have been on the single. And, uh, yeah, 
but it, yeah, I didn't think it was that strange that there were two. I kind of liked it. Uh, and I also didn't even feel that it was panning out. You know, it was a very long album if you include the third disc, which I guess we should mention, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's not normally even discussed, you know, but the third disc was an album of jams from the sessions. Um, and there are like five of them. Uh, it's Johnny's birthday, which actually was recorded for a, a different project. I think um, they were collecting various uh, stars recording a birthday tribute to John and then would, you know, sent them all in. And this was George's contribution. We also know about Janis Joplin's one too, because that was released on one of her uh, posthumous uh, collections, you know, without takes and things. Uh, the second one is Plug Me In, uh, I Remember Jeep, Thanks for the Pepperoni, and Out of the Blue. Out of the Blue, you could see as a sort of normal George Harrison kind of title, or John, it's close to one of John's. Uh, right. But, uh, you know, it was, and yeah, I can't say that I always play that that disc when I play the album. I played it this weekend when I was listening, you know, and preparing for the show. Um, and was sort of, you know, pleasantly surprised how much I liked them, actually. You know, just they're good jams. He had, a, he had a good bunch of musicians around him, and this is what they were doing to warm up or between takes or whatever it was, and, and, and I, I think it's fun. Yeah, it's also worth noting that the musicians that are part of the Apple Jam was the band that became Derek and the Dominoes. Right, yeah, yeah, and they could yeah, jam. so... <laughs> <laughs> they sure can. Yeah. I think for people that like just pure musicianship, you know, if you if you're interested in the fact that hey, Clapton's on here and Carl Radel's on here and Jim Gordon and those people, you know, it's an interesting lineup. Yeah, uh, of musicians. And if you were at George's home and these musicians were in the room just jamming, this is what it would sound like. Mm -hmm. And it was just, I think it was just a cool bonus that George threw in. Yeah, I don't look at it as really as part of. I don't really think of it as a triple album, even though it is. It's a double album with a bonus disc. Right, basically. <laughs> That's kind of how I looked at it. Yeah. And Jeep, by the way, was the name of um, Eric Clapton's dog. Uh. So he named it after him. And um, congratulations, congratulations. It's Johnny's birthday. Was a song where they took the melody of the song "Congratulations," which was a Cliff Richard hit <laughs> from 1968. They just took the melody from that and, and changed the words to it's Johnny's birthday. Maybe that's so why they were messing with the speed so much so that they couldn't get into a copyright thing. <laughs> I don't know about that, but uh, yeah, that's pretty weird what they did about speeding up the song that way. Yeah. But, yeah. Huh. So my own first encounter with the album would have been when it, you know, when it just came out um, and you know, at that time, I think we've discussed this before, at that time, the, the world was pretty much divided up between John and Paul partisans, you know, uh, and people were, people were taking sides. Rolling Stone was uh, really sort of abetting that by uh, publishing, you know, basically they became John's mouthpiece. Anytime John wanted to say something about the disputes going on at Apple, Rolling Stones pages were open to them. And Paul, I think, had annoyed Wenner by not giving him, you know, he, they did an interview on April 9th, 1969. And the next day, Paul's press kit with the self-interview and the question of whether there would be the Beatles and the, you know, feeling that he quit and all of that was released. And I think Wenner was a little upset that Paul hadn't clued him into that. I mean, it was only a day before. And mm. Wenner's magazine was a bi-weekly. This article wasn't going to turn up, obviously, until after the news was out. Uh, so that's just my reading about why, one reason, at least, why Rolling Stone was so sort of anti-Paul and pro-John at that time. I mean, yeah, when the McCartney album came out, you know, there's been a couple of biographies of Wenner out now where this has been discussed, where the person who reviewed it just wrote a sort of normal album review, and Wenner said, no, you can't. This is not just an album. This is a manifesto. 
you know? Uh, and, and this is, and, and so the art the review came out and it's all about how this is, uh, you know, Paul behaving aggressively towards John. And it really only told half the story there, you know? But so George, in a way, when this album came out, this was like, uh, you know, talk about out of the blue, the last of the, of the jam tracks. Uh, I don't think anybody expected you know, even though, you know, he'd written something and here comes the sun on the last Beatles album. And he, it was, it was known that he was writing a lot and they weren't getting on the Beatles albums, but I don't think anybody expected this explosion of stuff, you know? Right. Um, and I, I thought it was just great to hear, um, just because they, you know, they're really all good songs. The spirituality, I think I was prepared for because, you know, we knew that that, that's what George was into. Um, Mm. um, During the weekend when I was listening to the album, I looked up all the songs in I Me Mine, uh, George Harrison's book that compiles the manuscripts and uh, and then the, you know, the finished lyrics beyond the manuscripts. So, you know, just type and his comments about most of the songs. He doesn't comment on every single one. But it's kind of interesting to see, I think it was in the write-up about My Sweet Lord, that he was a little reluctant to put out My Sweet Lord and some of the spiritual stuff because he thought it might seem too much to people who weren't into it. Um, mm. But then he, uh, then I guess he o- overcame that uh, feeling and, and, and put it out. I mean, there were several on the all, most of the, the songs you could, you could say in one way or another have that spiritual side. But the other thing about George's spiritual stuff is that you could also take some of them, not all of the ones on here, like the art of dying, you can't, uh, you could take a lot of them as kind of, you know, as if they're addressed to a woman rather than God. And on our last show, we had Ashley Khan here. I don't think we talked about this, but there was one interview where someone mentioned that to George and he said, yeah, I, I like that. That's, that's kind of what I had in mind that you could take these songs either way, but the message I want to put across is the spiritual message. So, yeah. So a lot of, a, a lot of George's songs are like that. Yeah. In fact, I remember, you know, it, it, it would come as a surprise to a lot of listeners, but for most of the time that we've studied and loved the Beatles and we love the song something and everybody says that's that's George's song for Patty. You know, George at one time in an interview said, well, it's it may not be about Patty. <laughs> so it could also be interpreted as being a song for God, too. Right. You know, and a lot of his songs are like that. And in, what is life? And in other other interviews, he said, "Well, I was wasn't really thinking of Patty so much as Frank Sinatra <laughs> or Ray Charles. <laughs> it might have been Ray Charles. Like he was thinking of it as a song somebody would cover. You know, right? <laughs> so, yeah. You know, on our last show with Ashley, I had pointed out that um, George had some hesitancy about the preachiness in his mind." of all my sweet lord and you know maybe his the fact that he was a little uncomfortable with it being such a spiritual song and wearing his uh spirituality on on his sleeve and was one of the reasons why he gave the song also to billy preston figuring you know billy's gospel background Mm -hmm. uh it probably fit billy's uh repertoire better and that's why billy preston did it and his version actually came out before george's and uh, and George recorded it anyway himself and ended up with a big hit. Right, right. Yeah, I was just thinking that, you know, talk, talk about God and mammon, you know. So we have My Sweet Lord we, overcomes his uh, thing about discussing the spiritual stuff in a song, puts it out as a single, and then gets sued, <laughs> you know, for supposedly plagiarizing. Yeah. And then that led to another song later on in the George Harrison canon, as we know, uh, and a video, but uh, yeah, this song. So that, that was, I mean, I don't know if we need to get into the case, but it was kind of interesting to me in that, um, first of all, the judge was an actual composer. Richard Owen had uh, at least one opera done in New York during my time at the times. 
And so he sort of knew what he was looking at when he, when he was looking at the plagiarism aspect. And I think he decided that it was subconscious plagiarism, that George wasn't necessarily saying, why don't I, why don't I write a song that sounds like he's so fine? It just, you know, was sort of in there somewhere. And that's what it, how it came out. Well, George said that he was really influenced by Oh Happy Day. That's right. By the Edwin Hawkins singers. And coincidentally, since you brought up Billy Preston's recording, they're on it. <laughs> <laughs> they're backing up Billy Preston on My Sweet Lord. That's funny. <laughs> and, you know, you were talking about George being reluctant to mix spirituality in. He, he talked about My Sweet Lord and that in the beginning, uh, they're chanting hallelujah. He didn't want to start with Hare Krishna. Mm -hmm. He just worked that in. <laughs> so it would, I, he kind of eased that into the song. So, uh, yeah, I never realized that before, but George has said that. Mm -hmm. The other interesting thing for me about the case was the outcome, which was that partway through this, George and Alan Klein parted ways. Alan Klein then bought Bright Tunes, which was the company that was suing George. And when the judge ruled, he said, you know, but it's inappropriate of your former manager to have bought this and now be the other side of the lawsuit. So the penalty will be that George can buy bright tunes for exactly what Klein paid for it. So it cost George some money, but then he ended up with a new song catalog and Klein didn't make any money on that transaction. So that I thought was a cool touch. Yeah. Just knowing that George actually owns He's So Fine. Yeah. He could sue himself. It sounds like the Ruddles. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, Darren, did you eventually yes. uh, get, you know, more comfortable with the spiritual stuff? How did that, oh, how did well, that change for you? No, I don't, I don't ever remember having an issue with it. You know, having my sweet Lord from, and my collection from when I was five years old, I don't remember it really resonating with me either way. It just was a great, a great song. I was always a fan of the song as the years went past, as the years passed by. I think I probably saw the album enough times in the store to know that it was a substantial album. Mm -hmm. You couldn't check out the song tracks. I remember probably on the eight track or something like that. I remember remember looking over the song titles, you know, browsing around in the store uh, stores back then and thinking it was strange that there was a song called Thanks for the Pepperoni, <laughs> uh, because the A-track, there's no explanation of anything. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of the Apple Jam tracks were kind of scattered within with the regular songs on the A-track for timing and, and uh, formatting purposes. But um you know, when I did get the album finally, then in the mid seventies, uh, just a completely, uh, I completely embraced it, and and um, it was like having a George Fest. So much, so much music. At this, by this point, though, I was well aware of the fact that you know George was, uh, you know, in many ways as talented a writer as Paul and and John, mm -hmm. and uh, it just was like. You know, I lost, I did not get to experience that feeling that somebody would have had in 1970, say if I was an adult, uh, going to the store, finding out that George Harrison's first serious solo effort is a triple album. Still at a time when double albums were rather unique. Mm -hmm. um, they happened from time to time, but it wasn't like, you know, necessarily commonplace to see lots of double albums in night by 1970 but triple album mm -hmm. quite possibly the first uh, i think rock triple album uh if i'm not mistaken so you know being able to actually experience i miss that i would have loved to have experienced the feeling of finding out for the first time that george harrison is going to be putting out a triple album you know and then the 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 grand nature of the music. I mean, everything about it is monumental and, you know, it's perfection. I mean, the size of the album itself mirrors the size of the music. And that was something that unfortunately, you know, I didn't get to experience, you know, upon it, the album's first, first appearance. But I, I never had any issue the, embracing anything about either My Sweet Lord Isn't a Pity or the, uh, 
all the or the old things must pass album and i think it's pretty remarkable of an effort and what you know what what george was sitting on these last few years with the beatles in the way of songs and uh ideas and his musicianship and you know it's all been said about the album and it's all deserving mm -hmm. another thing that's interesting about this album is that we know things now that we didn't know when it was released in 1970 that put a lot of it in perspective for instance we know that an awful lot of these tracks well bunch of them anyway uh, all things must pass hear me lord let's see i think let it down <clears throat> excuse yeah. me some of the others were were all tried during the let it be sessions or get back sessions as they were at the time and didn't get very far uh you know although when i was working on the mccartney book uh there was a a section about, you know, the other's response to, you know, Maxwell, which was done at those sessions too. And, uh, you know, uh, George and John, uh, particularly taking, taking him to task for that song. And I added up all the timings and the amount of time that they spent on Maxwell Silver Hammer was almost exactly the same as the amount of time they spent on All Things Must Pass. So hmm. it's interesting that, you know, they didn't get that far on All Things Must Pass. You know, you, there's there's not a lot of anything that could be released as a, a Beatles version of it, you know, seriously. You know, what's remarkable about, about this is that, at least on the surface, it never appeared to be an issue about sharing the spotlight for Paul and John. I mean, from day one, Ringo always had a song to sing and George always had a song to sing. And it wasn't long. It was pretty early on. Mm -hmm. He was contributing a song or two as a songwriter. Right. So there really wasn't much of an issue, at least not for most of the time, mm -hmm. on uh, John and Paul's willingness, uh, willingness to share the spotlight. And we even know from the discussions we've had about that final meeting in the fall of 1969 when John suggested how the next Beatle album after Abbey Road, which never happened, should be divided up. Uh, John was giving George as many tracks as he was getting and Paul was getting, right? It was for... Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that, for, but that was addressing George's complaint that he wasn't getting as many songs on albums as they were, and he felt he should. Uh, okay, it's remarkable to think that as, as, as late as January 1969, that George was uh, coming up with these outstanding songs mm -hmm. that, in the case of Maxwell Silver Hammer, are actually better than some of the things Paul was coming up with. Mm -hmm. And yet George was still getting met with uh, indifference. Right. And it, it's remarkable that actually George stuck around or didn't say... You know, I don't, I don't know what the mindset of the musician and an established band was like in the late 60s, but, you know, are you thinking solo album? I mean, a real solo album, not like electronic sound or Wonderwall music. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you yeah. don't have many instances where a, a, major, a major band, one of the members of a major band was going off to do a major solo album. Today, it would have happened like, you know. Yeah. It would have been the norm. Uh, but you, it's amazing that George didn't like... I don't know, not lose his cool, but... Well, he did, you know, he did sort of. Bail early on. I got these songs, guys. Maxwell Silver Hammer, and I got five of these. Well, Come on. Well, yeah, I mean, but he did. He did say that, and and uh, maybe not Max, citing Maxwell specifically, but he did make it clear that he had all these songs and played through them, and in the Let It Be film, you know, when he gets to I Me Mine, he says, I don't care if you're going to use it in your special or not, you know, I mean, he's kind of resigned himself that his stuff is being overlooked, and he did walk out, you know, for a week or so, and that was one of the issues, and when he walked out, and this is another thing that we didn't know about at the time, um, but we know about now, we, he walked out, went home, and wrote Wawa. And Wawa, mm. as he explains in I Me Mind, apart from being a pedal, also meant headache. You know, you're giving me a headache. And Wawa was, you know, part of his response to, you know, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore where no one's respecting my stuff, you know. So that's another thing we didn't know. Uh, 
So there are two. One, how many things he brought to Let It Be that are on this album, and then Wawa. If you listen to some of the interviews that George was giving late in the Beatles group careers, he would occasionally bring up that it was a struggle to get his songs played uh, in the group. You just didn't know from the tone of his voice how much it really bothered him inside. Right. And um, yeah, in fact, during the Get Back, Let It Be sessions, there's a moment where he does say to John, you know, I'm thinking about making a solo album. Mm. John said to him, yeah, great. You know, you should do that. So, you know, the seeds were being planted then. Right. And um, I just wonder, while the group is rehearsing this stuff, while they're rehearsing All Things Must Pass and Hear Me, Lord, and Let It Down, what are John and Paul thinking? Are they really thinking this is inferior to their songs? Or do they just think, well, you know, we're the main songwriters. You know, we'll throw George, you know, his usual quota of two songs and that'll be it. But is he re- are they really thinking that these songs are not that strong? I guess they must have been because um, they didn't really finish any of them. I mean, except for For You Blue. And um, I mean, mine had to be done later once it, it was decided that there was going to be film of it in the in in the movie and they had to go into the studio and record it afresh right so yeah they Not- they must have they must have thought you know and and maybe maybe some of their issue was the spirituality too although they they seem not to have been bothered by it in within you without you hmm. but you know he brought in I hear me we- lord and all things must pass maybe they thought you know i, I don't know if this is what our audience is into I think, yeah, my, my, my point might have been also fueled by the fact that George's objections are so mannered and so calm, that English way. You know what I mean? You know, I, I, I'm from New York City, and I know that my reaction would have been a lot different. <laughs> Probably would have been a few, you know what I mean, louder and uh, with some uh, expletives thrown in there for, for good measure. You don't want to, why don't you want to record my effing songs? Yeah. But, uh, and then... You know, again, love to be the fly on the wall the very first time Paul or John got their eyes on George's album. You know, what they thought, what they heard, you know, when they heard or saw it, whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, look look what I got, guys. Mm-hmm. Look what I'm putting. Yeah, that's one thing that bothers me a lot about this whole scenario is that I don't recall there ever being a time when, when John or Paul ever talked about George's songs during the Get Back, Let It Be sessions and why they chose not to include them for their album or for that matter, you know, discussing his solo music Mm -hmm. during the all things must pass sessions. John did visit George one day and George played him whatever they were working on. And he was knocked out by Mm -hmm. it. But Mm -hmm. apart from the fact that, um, you know, the, the famous David Wig interview from 1971 that I love to quote, where he says, would George ever have flourished like that if we had carried on? No chance. At least he's saying flourish. Mm-hmm. So he's recognizing the fact that George did blossom, you know, as a songwriter and overall artist. So, but they they rarely talked about each other's solo music, really. All the Beatles, <laughs> when right. you get down to it. So, um, yeah. I wish, uh, you know, John and Paul, even Paul today, if someone could confront him, why didn't you recognize George more so towards the end? You know, every now and then they'll say, well, you know, something's one of our best songs. And, you know, but still, given the fact that he was so prolific then in 1969 and 1970, you know, why couldn't they recognize that in such a way? Well, I can't say 1970 since they ended in 69. And finish with I Me Mine, I know, in January of 1970. But, you know, why couldn't they recognize that at the time? Yeah. I was just going to say, but they were young men. Egos were involved. You know, if they were in their 50s, maybe the whole thing would have been different. But, you know, you know, the breakup was beginning to get a little, uh, the disagreements were getting a little, uh, a little more barbed. And, uh, you know, they were young guys, the ego, fresh egos and, you know, Maybe I wouldn't have allowed uh, a bandmate, you know what I mean, to, to, to steal some of my thunder, even though inside I'd be thinking, boy, he's coming up with the goods here. Right. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah. 
We'll never know. We'll never know how, what was going on in their heads at that time. Yeah, you know, basically yeah. everyone was writing stuff and they were pushing for their stuff. And George has said in some interviews that the reason he wasn't pushing as well was that he just sort of didn't see himself as the kind of person who would sort of, you know, push his way in. And uh, But it obviously did frustrate him, especially once he had so many songs that were you know, waiting to be recorded. And, you know, had Apple continued, I mean, this was, at least from John's point of view, this was clearly what he saw as the ideal. We come together and we do a Beatles album maybe once a year, and then otherwise we each do whatever we want. And John sure did. You know, John had all of his experimental things and he had his films with Yoko and, uh, you know, and the Beatles. I mean, he had solo singles out while the Beatles were still a going concern. Uh, so, you know, when he gave performances while the Beatles were still a going concern. So, so he clearly looked at it that way. And it looked like Apple was going to be a big enough bag for everybody to do everything they wanted. It just wasn't necessarily going to be on a Beatles album. And, uh, right. you know, and then the 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 four 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 two thing that they came up with, uh, you know, would have also made that a little more, you know, easy to deal with from George's point of view, in the sense that uh, he he can't say that they're overlooking him anymore because you know, well, yeah, there'd be eight Lennon McCartneys and one and four Harrisons. The Lennon McCartneys are real Lennon, really Lennon separately and McCartney separately most of the time, so. Yeah, I think, yeah, the, the, you know, my, my initial impression of the album is, you know, in a way still the same, even though now, unlike then, now we have heard the rest of George's work uh, since then. But a certain amount of surprise at how much stuff he had. Um, and there's also a lot of variety here. We've talked about the uh, spiritual stuff, but there's also Apple Scruffs. There's also mm -hmm. Wah Wah, which even we didn't know what it was totally about, was kind of a cool song and uh, let it down sort of about, you know, Frankie Crisp in his house. Uh, lot, lots yep. of different things. And uh, yeah, this is an album that definitely has survived the test of time, I think we can say. When you, when you study everything that, that led up to this album, it's extraordinary. It, it really explains how George really, really did flourish as an artist. Because if you go back to, say, around the time that um, Apple launched, mm -hmm. George produced albums for Billy Preston, two albums for him. He produced an album for Jackie Lomax. He produced an album for Doris Troy. He produced the Radha Krishna Temple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, he did all that stuff, and he also hung out with Bob Dylan and the band, mm -hmm. and which is where um, he wrote I'd Have You Anytime. And when he hung out with them, that was part of the inspiration for the song All Things Must Pass, because mm -hmm. I know George said that uh, The Weight was influential, the song The Weight, in writing All Things Must Pass. So he's hanging out with Bob Dylan and the band. He hung out with uh, Delaney and Bonnie on tour, you know, hanging out with very high caliber musicians outside the Beatles. So between that and all the songs that he's writing during this period of time, by the time all things must pass happened, he had such a backlog of really strong material. And um, it's even extraordinary. The first time I ever heard that, isn't it a pity and the art of dying dated back to 1966. <laughs> it's, it's yeah. really incredible when you think, well, maybe while they were doing revolver, George is coming up with these songs. And then why wouldn't the Beatles take those? Mm -hmm. <laughs> those are amazing songs. So there are songs here from 1966 through 1970. Many of them were while he was in the Beatles. There were new ones from 1970. And then on top of all that, there's all the stuff that didn't come out on All Things Must Pass. Mm -hmm. I guess before we head into, uh, we're each going to discuss some favorite tracks. Um, more yeah. specifically, maybe we should discuss just at, at least briefly how we feel about the uh, the demo bootlegs that have come out. You know, the the sort of stripped down. You know, the things, the, the recordings he made of the songs for Phil Spector to listen to. Phil, Phil Spector produced the album. 
Um, Darren, are you, are you familiar with those? Yeah, uh, basically beware of that. Mm -hmm. uh, someone uh, that I worked with, uh, actually Vin Skelsa from WFUV, uh, many, many New York City radio people, uh, listeners and fans of uh, rock radio and through the you know, 70s, 80s, will know Vin Skelsa. Vin was at WFUV for a time and he was kind enough to actually run off a copy for me of uh, Beware of Apco, which I was familiar with but had never heard. You know, had never heard so many of the songs in one place. Mm -hmm. There had always been fragments online and whatnot. And it quickly became a, a disc that I was living with. Mm -hmm. This was in the 90s that I really got all of these tracks in one place. And uh, I, although it's somewhere around here, I, for the life of me, can't find mm. it uh, these days. But uh, that uh, immediately became a favorite of mine. There's a, such all wonderful songs and done stripped down. You would think songs that in most instances were so produced on the finished album might lack in demo, you know, form, but that's not the case with all of them. And hearing George introduce some of the songs, you know, title and whatnot, it, it really lends itself to be a great alternate All Things Must Pass album that hopefully someday comes out. Yeah. Where all of these demos, if they need a little polish here or there, yeah get it and, and they all come out as one commercially available album i don't think there's probably stuff i haven't heard i don't know if there's more material that could fit on one lp i don't i don't know of you know the bootleg cd that i was given a copy of was a single but uh, it would make a heck of a alternate old things must pass and hopefully someday that comes out because for those who haven't heard today all you need to do is go you know, searching around on the internet, you could track down the demos of the old things with past tracks, but they're really something something special. And it, you know, the the fact that this material is sitting out there makes that early takes of volume one album even more frustrating mm -hmm. because there was so much stuff that could have been put on the first volume and there could have been subsequent volumes. The uh, the album that came out with the uh, the George Harrison Living in the Material World film. Yeah. In fact, actually, on, on the most recent CD reissue of All Things Must Pass, the color cover, the version of Beware of Darkness that says Beware of Apco is, is actually on the, the disc. Um, and some right. other demos and, uh, you know, so, so they've Let been, down. yeah, they've been uh, leaking them out bit by bit. But you're right, you, they should have uh, sort of an alternate. They should all come out in one place mm -hmm. and yeah. i mean who knows while we're sitting here talking you know all year long we've been talking about the let it be 50 at the let it be 50 at the box at the box at the movie it gets delayed and then we're waiting for the plastic ono band box set and i think we have enough to go on that that'll happen but it was delayed well it's been quiet out of the harrison camp but hopefully that's because of covid and in all things must pass set is also in the works and it's been delayed and maybe if that's the case it would have hopefully all of the you know things that have circulated through the years under the beware of apco umbrella mm -hmm. okay yeah what you're saying kind of reminds me a lot of because the, these demos you had a few of them from the uh the remastered all things was best but you also have a few of them on early takes yeah volume one so this is kind of like the same thing with the Beatles White Album demos being on the Beatles Anthology. <laughs> and then when the White Album box set comes out, you put them all out, all on one disc. Yeah. So yeah, like I really... just said, the few tracks have legally leaked out, but we really need to have everything brought together under one in one place. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I absolutely cherish those demos. Because yeah. there's something about John, Paul, and George, each alone with an acoustic guitar. And for some reason, you know, there's a warmth that you feel when you hear these recordings. And you also get to realize, and I've said this before, that when you just listen to the demo of a song and you draw the conclusion that it's a great song just as a demo, that tells you something. When it's stripped down to just one person and a guitar or a piano, and you love it that way, then the song is really strong. Although that's also coming from the perspective of hearing the finished recordings first. But, um, 
Yeah, I do feel that way about hearing George's stuff. I love the sound of George and an acoustic guitar. He was a great acoustic guitar player. A lot of his stuff, sometimes when you hear him as demos, you even feel like there's even more of a Bob Dylan influence in his music that way on certain songs. Mm -hmm. And also, there's a handful of songs that are part of Beware of Apco that um, he never did release. Or as far as we know, he never tried to finish as songs because they're not really all that complete. They needed a bit more work. Mm -hmm. But like, for example, you know, there's a song called Window Window, which the Beatles, in fact, rehearsed during Get Back, Let mm -hmm. It Be. So um, and there's all these, you know, these other song titles that I think our listeners have probably, you know, have heard before. Cosmic Empire. Sure. Mother Divine. Right. That kind of stuff. Nowhere to go. And I think that had George worked more on those songs, they could have developed into really strong songs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to see those released too. Um, I, I go back and forth about uh, whether even the album should be remixed. Um, sometimes, you know, it, it does sound because of the Spectre production technique, it can sound a little bit muddy. And hearing the acoustic demos beside them uh you know it just sort of clarifies it all and yet you know it was the sound of the time and i have uh, you know really good associations with it and I, I don't know that i'd want it to be totally stripped down you know instead but I, I had the impression, you know, from reading some of George's interviews as well, that he sort of rethought it a little bit. He, he thought maybe it was a bit too dense. Uh, but, you know, what, for 1970, for what it was, for it, it, was, it was perfect for its time. And, uh, you know, it was a couple more quick, quick observations. Actually, George did kind of point out, I think, when he revisited the album to put out the 2000 remix that he was a little like taken back by the grand nature of the and the density of the production. And he even thought, gee, maybe I should clean this stuff out, you know, uh, take this, uh, the specterization off it, but uh, he chose not to right. and uh, managed to come out with a remix that cleaned it up and without really losing any of the, the luster. The only thing that I was a little eh, about about the 2000 version was I wasn't crazy about the way he reconfigured the album and putting bonus tracks and whatnot in the middle of the running order. Yeah. Uh, but I know that for, <laughs> for packaging and for presentation purposes and for balance and whatnot. I, you know, you know, it, that was fun. Yeah, I, I agree with you about the, the bonus tracks. You know, maybe they should have gone all at the end rather than, than at the end of CD one. I don't think it was a remix. I think it was just a remaster. In fact, yeah, that's all it yeah. was. So what remix? Yeah, the only thing that was remixed was My Sweet Lord Two Thousand, which was you know sort of okay. a different version in a way, uh, in a big way. Yeah. So we should probably look um, at our you know favorites. We we were each to choose five favorites. Uh, from the album and I didn't do my homework. So I'm going to let the other guys go first and I will deal with the leftovers <laughs> or. What? So you got a picture now in the classroom, Alan's the guy who's sitting behind me and Ken looking over our shoulders, <laughs> right? Yeah. Mm. Trying to get our answers. So who wants to start? Uh, How about you, Darren? Okay. Um, I picked seven tracks. I want the just five. So I decided what I'll do is I'll take two of the ones that I'd consider as my favorites from the album which was the, sing the first single, my, which we talked about already, My Sweet Lord with Isn't It a Pity, which was the first version on the album the, that was uh, the quote-unquote B-side of the My Sweet Lord single, even though it's supposed to be a double A-side. So I'll put those two aside. Darren likes those two. But I'm going to focus on uh, five other tracks uh, that are favorites of mine from the album. And, and it seems as though I picked uh, at the end of the album, or at least side four, and the beginning of the album for my choices. And really in no particular order, I topped my list off with Hear Me Lord, the final song of George's, um, not, you know, excluding Apple Jam. Hear Me Lord would be uh, one of my favorites. Also towards the end of the album, Art of Dying mm. is another one near the top, if not my favorite song on the album. The title wow. track. The title track would be one 
that I would single out, Wawa, and closing out, uh, I'll go with Awaiting on You All as the five, Darren's five focus tracks. Uh, and if you want the colored vinyl edition of my <laughs> five focus tracks, you will also get a colored bonus seven inch single that has My Sweet Lord and Isn't It a Pity version one on it. So my five, Hear Me Lord, Art of Dying, All Things Must Pass, Wawa, Awaiting on You All. <laughs> Yeah, I got to ask you, Darren, you said The Art of Dying is your favorite on the album? It's close. It's right up there. It might be my favorite. It's Can I ask why? One. I like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I think it's a fantastic song. I just, you know, um, I don't know. I mean, it's just, you know, uh, I don't know. I just, I really, really like it. I mean, uh, why do I feel like I'm on trial here? <laughs> no, I... You know, I love knowing why people like what they like and why they don't like certain songs. And maybe there's something specific you can point out. Well, you know, actually, you know, it, what's weird about the song that I like is um, I don't know if it's Jim Gordon playing drums. Um, mm. I love the drumming on that song, but yeah. I don't know if that's enough. If that's the reason why the entire song appeals to me so much, that it's one of my favorites on the album. Because Ringo and Alan White do appear on the album. I don't know if anyone else is on. Uh, uh, playing drums, I think dude, Jim Gordon played the lion share of the drum of the drums. I see here that according to this, Phil Collins was playing percussion on Art of Dying, but that's not what I'm hearing. I'm hearing the regular drum bit, and I've always loved the drumming on Art of Dying. Uh, the lyrics are really heavy too. You know, oh really sure. Heavy. You know that yeah. could get lost on folks who may listen to the album a little more passively. Uh, but I don't know. I, I, another possibility is my tendency maybe to go for tracks that I'm not prone to hear more, hear as much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know what I'm saying? That maybe makes me gravitate in the case of not only Art of Dying, but Hear Me Lord also. Yeah. Um, as, as another one of my favorites on the album. But uh, maybe I wouldn't say Art of Dying would be my favorite. I mean, I think more times than not, when Wawa comes on, the volume gets usually cranked. Mm -hmm. mm. So it's a tough one. It's like, you know, the weakest track on the album of George's 18 songs on the first two discs. The one that maybe I like the least is probably a uh, ballad of Sir Frankie Crisp, Let It Roll. Mm. And yeah. even that I love. So, mm. you know. You can't go wrong with any of the I tracks. Think, I think yeah. when I first got the album. When I first got the album, for some reason, I was very drawn to Run of the Mill. And I couldn't tell you why. Uh, it just was a song that I just gravitated to at the beginning. I remember when I was still a teenager and I had just got my copy. Something about Run of the Mill. I remember making a mixtape of a bunch of different things. And that was a song that I picked off all things from his past to put on this mixtape. Mm. Okay. Hey, Ken. Very interesting. All right. That's very interesting what you said there, Darren, because I, I can relate to trying to stay away from the singles very often because those are the ones that get the most airplay. And it would have to be really a strong single that I never get tired of for me to include that as being amongst my favorite. But I will do that in the case of All Things Was Passed because I never, ever, ever get tired of My Sweet Lord or What Is Life. I think they're two killer tracks. And, um, you know, everything about My Sweet Lord... I can always remember going back to when I was a kid listening to Top 40 Radio when that song was played and constantly, and it was a number one hit for four weeks. And man, that song sounded so good on the radio. The way that the acoustic guitars kick in and then the slide guitar uh, solo, which, which really added so much to that song and the fullness of it all with the chanting of the, the Hallelujah and the Hare Krishna. There's no other single that's like My Sweet Lord. Mm -hmm. And um, it was masterfully done. I really, I, I really believe that. Um, what is life is a killer track. You know, you talk about so many great rock songs have a great guitar intro at the very beginning. The Beatles certainly had a lot of those. To start off with, you know, that biting guitar of uh, the lead guitar line of what is life and then the brass kicking in. And, you know, it's such a very catchy song. You know, I never, ever get tired of hearing what is life. And it's funny that you mentioned The Art of Dying because that's one of my favorites, too. And it could very well be. You mentioned Jim Gordon and the drums, you know, how that kicks in 
with the fast drums and when he does those as fills before the brass comes in. And I love the brass sound of it and the whole message of the song. You know, um, nothing in this life that I've been trying can equal or surpass the, the art of dying. Every, every message in that song, like the highest thing that you can attain is to get to the next level, a higher level, a higher plane. That's what we're all striving for. And, um, you know, it's very, very daring for any artist to put those words, that message in a song, something that heavy. Also, I would put in there, All Things Must Pass. It's just a great song overall the melody the uh the string arrangement the message in the song it's very comforting that you know there's good and bad in life and we all have to deal with it and uh it's also kind of interesting that while this this album was recorded um it took longer than it probably should have it took five months to record all things was passed but george's mother was dying Mm -hmm while the recording the recordings were taking place of this and his father was sick too so that you know when you think about all things must pass away and think pass away and death you're thinking about that as well and it's also you know a song of comfort at the same time while it's also sad in moments um it's a really powerful song i think it's one of his greatest compositions ever and Run of the Mill. Run of the Mill is a song that when I was first listening to the song as a kid, I eh, didn't really get much notice of it. Now I love it, especially when you think about the whole background behind it and George talking about the struggles he was having at Apple at the time, but in particular with Paul. And, you know, I, I believe he said in either an interview or, or several interviews that it was directed at Paul. But it's one of those songs that lyrically really flows and it's just talking about the struggles in a relationship and no matter what we're all responsible for our own actions it's you that decides which way you you will turn that kind of thing and um it's got such an unusual melody behind it there's no other song quite like that one and i've heard that olivia harrison has said that that's her favorite uh of all the songs from all things must pass in fact it's in that radio special that i mentioned at the very beginning uh she said that but um, a very unique song, uh, Run of the Mill. I love it for everything, the melody, the message, the lyrics, the full arrangement. So those would be my top five. Okay. So mine. I guess I'm not really going to be able to pick up all the ones you guys haven't mentioned because uh, uh, one of my favorites is a song that you know I don't think normally gets an awful lot of respect, but it does here seemingly, and that is Art of Dying. <laughs> For me, it's kind of personal though, because um, when my father was diagnosed with cancer in like 1989, I'm not necessarily one of these people who will look to music for solace, you know, but I pulled out uh, All Things Must Pass and gave it a listen and I think started with Art of Dying and then All Things Must Pass and then skipped around. But Art of Dying, uh, you know, was just, it's kind of an interesting track to listen to if that's what you're going through, you know, your family's going through and, uh, and the same with all things must pass and just some perspective on, you know, the fact that we do all die. I mean, there's, there's no way around it really. Um, at least I haven't been able to find one yet. And, uh, so, you know, so that for me, I mean, those songs, will always have that association for me, even though it was like 20 years after the album came out and I'd been living with the album those 20 years, that sort of changed it for me. And in fact, actually on the basis of, of listening to the album, reading the lyrics, listening really carefully. And I decided I'd, I'd check out what George was, um, was on about here. And so I pulled down a copy of the Bhagavad Gita, which I kind of knew a bit for a number of reasons, including the fact that the libretto for Philip Glass's second opera, Satyagraha, is actually taken from the, from the Bhagavad Gita rather than 
you know, a normal opera libretto. And the opera is about Gandhi, but the, the text of the Bhagavad Gita kind of works with what you're seeing on stage. But that's an aside. I started reading it, and in the beginning, uh, you know, the Bhagavad Gita is a discussion between Krishna and Arjuna. Arjuna is a prince and um, he is about to go into battle and on each side of the battle are family members of his. And he is, each side is allowed, the leader of each side is allowed to choose a chariot driver and he chooses Krishna. And while they're waiting for the battle to start, Arjuna is saying, you know, I don't, I don't want to do this. Look, there's people on both sides that are that I'm related to. I, I, I don't want to be involved in this destruction. And Krishna is basically saying, listen, you have to. This is your duty. And the reason you shouldn't make such a big deal about it is he says, I've come down to this earth many times and taken many bodies and lived many lives and the only, and so have you, but I remember mine and you don't remember yours. And that's the difference. And I thought, wow, that is just such a stunning kind of way of talking about life and death and reincarnation and, and all of that. And it really, I don't want to know if I want to say helped because I mean, he still died. But at that moment, you know, right at the beginning of that saga, when he's just diagnosed, I'm just hearing about it, it really, in a way, did help. And I always wanted to write George a note saying this and never did. And uh, when I went to London to do interviews about the anthology, I, I kind of wanted to talk to him about that as well. But he wasn't doing interviews for the anthology. And I thought it would look like a, like a ploy you know, so I didn't say anything. And uh, yeah, so anyway, that's Art of Dying and also All Things Must Pass. Uh, so those are two. Uh, again, I have to follow Darren with Wawa just because even not knowing what it was originally about, I think it's a very cool song. I, I love the sound of it. I like the arrangement. Um, and it's for a song about go into a Beatles session and leaving with a headache, it's awfully upbeat, <laughs> you know? Um, it has a lot of energy, and that would also uh, count for a waiting on you all. I, I just love the sort of drive of that song. I do wonder whether the Pope ever owned 51% of General Motors. I, I, I think that's unlikely, but um, I wonder what he meant by that. Um, so the album is still presenting us with questions that we're unable to answer. Um, so that's what, uh, four. Um, so one more, huh? Mm. You know, I like them all. You know that line? What? You know that line, <laughs> the Pope owns 51% of General Motors, I always took to be a commentary on the Catholic Church, the amount of money mm -hmm. uh, that the Catholic Church has, the amount of power. Right. Uh, that it wields and just a generalization kind of a kind of a witty way of making a comment on that yeah yeah probably i mean george's background is catholic isn't it so he, he probably yep. felt you know um he can say these things you know that that uh maybe someone else maybe john couldn't you know but yeah i think i think your interpretation is probably it's probably not meant literally <laughs> how about Okay, here's one that you guys haven't mentioned yet, Behind That Locked Door. Not really spiritual, mm. um, but Behind That Locked Door and I'd Have You Any Time, I think are both kind of his nods to his own um, passion for country music. You know, uh, Behind That Locked Door, more than I'd Have You Any Time, really gives him uh, an opportunity to to do a country track. And it is in that sense, so different from um, all the others that um, I'll, I'll pick that just sort of as a, a dark horse, <laughs> so to speak, uh, track. And uh, although I suppose if I had looked for another half a second, I might have chosen Beware of Darkness instead. But let's go with Behind That Locked Door just because no one, none, neither of you have chosen it. So, you know, you since you mentioned country music, we should um, give some credit to Pete Drake. Oh, yeah. 
who did some really fantastic um, pedal steel guitar mm -hmm. on this album. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things I loved about the remastered All Things Must Pass is when they included the bonus track of I Live For You, mm -hmm. which also has Pete Drake on it. Very country-esque song. It made me think, you know, if I could have redone All Things Must Pass in 1970, I would have put I Live For You in mm -hmm. there and take out um, isn't it a pity version too? Okay. <laughs> but uh, but I, I couldn't understand why a song that good could have been left off of All Things Must Pass. Yeah. But um, yeah. And in fact, Pete Drake is who led Ringo to record Bukuza That's Blues. Right. Yeah. So um, do we have anything else to get to? I would like to comment a little bit about the production on the album. Okay because um, I really think that Phil Spector did a masterful job. Whenever I think of All Things Must Pass, I have that image from the poster inside of George in front of that stained glass window. And I kind of feel like so many of the songs being spiritual, not all of them, but um, it made me feel like with his wall of sound that we were hearing great rock music in a cathedral. <laughs> and I really love... Uh, that particular sound and what he applied to it. I think it worked really well. You know, we're living at a time where a lot of people knock Phil Spector and the wall of sound and they look at it as being kind of dated. And, but I think it really worked in this particular case. Interesting thing, because you, you both brought this up. George did say that he felt that Phil Spector's production at times was a bit too much, too much sound. And even before he passed away, he was saying that. And it's kind of interesting that in the middle of Making All Things Must Pass, Phil Spector bailed out on the album, mm -hmm. kind of like the rock and roll sessions in a way. <laughs> and so um, when George took over, he recorded Behind That Locked Door, which you could tell is a much simpler production mm -hmm. from the rest of the album. Much the same way that you can tell that John Lennon produced tracks on rock and roll compared to the Phil Spector produced tracks. Mm -hmm. So there's a similarity there that um, that I see. Apparently, uh, Phil Spector, I think, broke his arm, so, so they said, around that time, and he left the session. So he was consulted later on with what to do, but um, George took over the production. So I think if you listen to songs on All Things Must Pass that have a, a simpler production, they probably were George's. But um, I still love what Phil Spector did on the album. And I think part of its success is because of the sound that he made. Like I said, no other song sounds like My Sweet Lord on the radio, especially as a hit record. And I think uh, Phil deserves a ton of credit for that. Yeah. And I'd love to hear these songs stripped down too. Don't get me wrong. But you have to give credit to at the time how things were and the fact that all things must pass was was this massive success seven weeks at number one here in the u.s and yeah the material is really great and i'll always say the songs are the most important but part of its big appeal was the production behind it not that i wouldn't want to hear it stripped down like i said or demos but you know i wouldn't change a hair for what phil Spector did on his production on all things must pass. Okay. Do you agree? <laughs> um, yeah, to, to a to a large totally extent. Hmm. Okay. I think it's it's amongst amongst not definitive, but amongst uh, Phil Spector's crowning achievements that album. I'd agree. Yeah, I could see that. And the album also, which you, somebody mentioned earlier on, not that the band wouldn't have started had they not been involved in the sessions, but. All Things Must Pass also ended up sprouting Derek and the Dominoes, who, by the way, the 50th anniversary of their only studio album, Layla and Other Assorted Love Songs, was a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Ken Womack has a book coming out next year uh, combining the, the stories, the history between All Things Must Pass and Layla, mm -hmm. both albums. Mm -hmm. Layla is one of my favorite albums of all time by any artist any band, any artist. So, you know, I can't wait to read Ken's book on that. Yeah. Okay. So I think we've um, 
celebrated all things must pass um, fairly adequately for this year. We'll probably return to it again in, you know, time for the 60th. <laughs> and uh, okay, so um, Ken mentioned that uh, we would be talking about John next time in the Plastic Ono Band book. Uh, we will also be looking at uh, the anniversary of John's last album, Double Fantasy. So mm. in the meantime, um, I think we should give our contact information. So shall we start with Darren? Sure. You can uh, reach out to me at WFUV. My email address there is Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. Or you can go to Facebook and uh, f send me a friend request at Darren DeVivo which is the main page I have. I also have a second one, which you can uh, simply click like, uh, and that is Darren DeVivo, WFUV DJ, Beatles podcaster, writer. And I am off this week. This is the week of Thanksgiving when we're recording this show. Uh, I am off this week, but uh, we'll be back on the air at WFUV Monday night, uh, November 30th at 10 p.m. And you can catch me uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday nights, 10 p.m. for the time being until midnight. Normally, I would go to 2 a.m., but due to the pandemic and the logistics of broadcasting from home, it's a two-hour show for now on weeknights, 10 p.m. to midnight, and also Saturday afternoons from 1 to 4 p.m., and that's a WFUV in New York City at 90.7 FM, 90.7 FM HD2. We're streaming anywhere in the world at WFUV.org. Uh, download our app, and you can listen on the WFUV app, and you can ask your smart speaker to play WFUV. Okay. Ken? Uh, my email address, if you'd like to contact me directly, is everylittlething at att.net. I should point out that a big development in my life <laughs> Uh, and the last month or so is that I now have my own YouTube channel. And so I now have three interviews that are on the channel. And a few days ago, my newest one was with Mark Hudson. And the reason why I interviewed him was in part because he is the producer for Joey Molland of Bad Finger, his new album called Be True to Yourself. He also produced an album that came out late last year that was a posthumous album for Harry Nilsson called Lost and Found. And we talked about those two albums, his work on both, and working with Ringo and his Beatle influence, and especially how much John Lennon influenced him. So if you can, please go to the YouTube page. It's just called Ken Michaels Radio. The very first interview was with Joey Mullen. The second interview is with Ashley Kahn, who we also interviewed here on Things We Said Today. And um, if you can, please subscribe to that channel, as well as our own channel, here on YouTube at Things We Said Today. I also have another uh, podcast show called Talk More Talk. It's a video podcast. It happens bi-weekly every other Monday night. And um, it's called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. And it's mainly about the solo careers of the Beatles. Our next show, which will be next Monday, which is November the 30th at 9 p.m. Eastern, will be a tribute to John Lennon. And we're going to have Al Sussman as a special guest to talk about John, how much John has meant to him, as well as to the rest of us. I'm joined by Kid O'Toole, uh, Tom Hunyadi, who you know from Two Legs, the podcast, the Paul McCartney podcast, and Joe Mayo, who's known as Mean Mr. Mayo, with his own YouTube channel. So that show is all about John. And after that show goes out live, and you can comment while the show is going on about what we're talking about, after that, the show is on YouTube, so you can subscribe to that channel as well, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. Other than that, my website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com, um, I have a Beatles trivia and games page, and you can now win Ashley Kahn's new book, which is called George Harrison on George Harrison, Interviews and Encounters. We all talked about that in our last show with Ashley, lots of transcriptions of George Harrison's interviews through the years uh, from 1962 up until the time of his death. And so you can win that along with so many other great prizes. And um, I believe that's it. Okay, so that's KenMichaelsRadio.com. And back to you, Alan. 
Okay, you can reach me, Alan Cozen, at on Facebook is probably the easiest way. Um, either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remix, my alter ego. And uh, you can also email all of us or any of us at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. I'll say that again because it's so long. Things we said today radio show, all one word at gmail.com. We have a Twitter feed, which is at Things We Said Fab, and we have a group Facebook page or two, uh, Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fans, and there's one that's just Things We Said Today, but the official one, so to speak, is Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fans. So thank you for listening, and we will see you next time. And happy Thanksgiving to you all. Yes, have a safe, healthy Thanksgiving. With plenty of cold turkey. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone, and uh, we'll see you on the other side.